style of debating that we're conducting throughout the entire seminar pretty much, there'll be some adjustments that happen towards the back end of it, is called Easter style debating. That is obviously the format that will be used at Easter's, at Grand Slam, at all the introductory tournaments that we have. In short, it is uh, you know, an adversarial sort of contest where there are two teams of three speakers each. You have 30 minutes of preparation, that might be you know, lower than the time that you had at school, which could have been 45 or one hour, but that is more than you know, sufficient time to get everything done. And then you present eight minute speeches, which is pretty standard for most debates. A few other things to note about the style of debating is that you get one adjudicator or one panel of adjudicators who come to one decision sort of unilaterally, and there's no draws and also, I think important to note just right at the start, there's no auto losses or whatever in this, in this format of debating or in any format of debating. Uh, the reason why I flag that now is that even though we're trying to teach you how to debate here, note that if you don't fulfill one of the requirements or we don't, you don't do something that we say, it's not like you're going to automatically lose a debate or whatever. You know, there's no perfect science to it. Uh, in Easter style debating, there's no points of information or reply speeches. If you don't know what those things are, good, you don't need to worry about them. And also there's a thing called topic selection, which we'll discuss later. In short, it means you have some sort of say over what specific topic you actually get to debate. So, what the basic aim of debating is, is that it exists to resolve what are often hypothetical problems which are presented in the topics that you will be given. These topics are also often referred to as motions. I think a good way to think about it is that since these debates are purely hypothetical in most circumstances, each team's sort of line of argumentation creates different worlds and the debate then is resolved by arguing whose world is better. So say the affirmative team on any given topic will have its six points or whatever and the negative team will have its six points and those present a different picture of what the world would look like under the respective policies that each team proposes. It is then the job of each team to try to you know, outmatch the other one. Obviously then the affirmative team is the team that should be defending the motion or supporting the topic that pops up and it's the job of the negative team to either support the status quo, that is what's going on now in the privation of that motion occurring, or any alternative that they themselves come up with. That is basically how debating works. We'll now go into specifics as to what each individual speaker should do, since there's three speakers on each team. The first speaker is probably the most important position in debating if you haven't done it a lot, insofar as it is the first thing that the adjudicator sees, it's the first time for people to, for you to present the case that you have. The roles of first speakers, whether both on affirmative or negative, are quite similar. They should do a lot of introductory groundwork for your team's case, and although you don't need massively elaborate introductions, say, it's important that first speech is structured to a requisite extent. It should be, you know, quite obvious within the first three minutes of the eight minutes that you have allotted of a first speaker's speech, specifically the avenue that your team believes that you'll be able to win the debate on. So you don't need to, you know, exactly outline every single line of argumentation that you're going to be making, but it should be clear at least what your team is going to be talking about, what they're standing by. Moreover, if you're the first speaker, that is when you should present any models or counter models that you have. We'll talk about those later, but that is effectively the mechanism by which you achieve the thing that the motion sets out to do. Or if you're on the negative team, you might have a counter model which does the same, but is in opposition to that which the affirmative team is doing. As I said, first speakers should be quite structured and involve a lot of what we call signposting, which is effectively just while your speech is going on, you're flagging where you are in your speech. And typically, most speeches, not just first speeches, probably shouldn't cover way too much ground that is like all disparate of one another. You should probably have, say, two to four individual and unique points. A few tips about first speakers. Because he's the first time an adjudicator or another team will see that which you're actually talking about, it's really beneficial if your first speaker talks about the most important stuff in the debate. The reason that that is true is that if it's not tactically wise to save your best point for the last 20 seconds of your second speaker just because you think, oh, we'll just you know, spring this on the negative team, then they'll have no time to respond. That's considered sort of improper to do. Rather, the best material should be something that is kind of open ground from the start of the debate so you're able to fend off any potential attacks that come from the opposition or the, affirm the, the, the negative or the affirmative team, depending on when you're specifically standing. Uh, note as well, one of the key distinctions between the two, speaker, the, the, the two first speakers is that the negative speaker, by virtue of speaking after the affirmative speaker, obviously, uh, gets a bit of rebuttal. But this rebuttal doesn't need to be, you know, particularly long or lengthy, but it should at least offer some sort of responses or defences against the main thrusts of the affirmative team's case. Many times <laughs> first negative is referred to as first response speaker say, so it's important that you respond to the main content that comes out uh, at, at you know, the affirmative team's case. 
Finally, uh, principled arguments, which is a type of argument that, again, we'll talk to you about a bit later, are probably things that should come out first. That's not necessarily something that you have to do, but typically it's conventional that principled arguments, if you do have them, come out quite early in the first speaker's speech. In essence, the first speaker should lay the platform for the remainder of the debate, uh, and it should be quite clear what the team is talking about as soon as that speech concludes. There probably shouldn't be a heap of new content that comes later in the debate. Is there any you know, queries that you have about first speeches generally? Cool. We'll go on to second speakers. Second speakers are quite a bit more straightforward and their position in debates is sometimes a bit fluid. If you have a debate that's really meaty and there's heaps of content, often second speakers, especially second affirmative speakers, their material is more focused on delivering a heap more content, having you know, extra points. But as I said earlier, the strongest points that your team have should probably go to first. It's not as if the second affirmative should drop some like massive bomb that transforms the debate. Note that the second affirmative speaker though is also the first response speaker, but for the affirmative team. So one of their crucial jobs is trying to respond to the main thrusts that the negative team's case is presented, especially early. Uh, I think as well something important and often overlooked that uh, second speaker should do is have any clarifications or defences specifically of a team's model or of a team's principle. Uh, say if you're debating a topic about, uh, you know, the, the, you want to implement quotas for women on corporate boards and the first affirmative gets up and say, well, our model is that we'll have more women on these corporate boards, but you haven't, say, defined what those quotas specifically are numerically or ascribed a value to them, and you haven't defined what corporate boards are. If half of the first negative team speaker is, you know, rebutting you on that ground, explaining that you need to quantify these things, that you need to define specifically, you know, where this occurs, then the second speaker is really the last chance that you properly have to you know, make any adjustments that you need to to your model, to make any massive defence to you know, the, the primary things, the mechanism by which you're trying to win the debate, because it is simply far too late to do it a third. It often happens, especially at like high school level, you see kids come out with like a model, and then that model gets annihilated, and then like the third affirmative gets up and he's like, oh, well, here's what we actually meant. Second speaker is the last chance that you really do have if you want to engage in a fair debate to clarify these things. Uh, finally, you know, uh, affirmative uh, or second speakers should have additional points, not a lot, they shouldn't be overly important. Often second negative at university level runs like a weird amorphous joke sort of point, which I can't really endorse, but is, is often quite amusing. Um, another thing just strategically, and it's more of a tip, sometimes because of the nature of debating, you know, I think at high school level it's, well, we'll give two points to, you know, first, we'll give two points to second. Rather, what you should be doing is just giving all your good material to first, and then second just picks up the scraps, which sometimes is, is independent points, but sometimes there'll simply be nothing for a second speaker to say. In that circumstance, trying to, what we call, reframe the debate is often a useful strategy, since you now know what both teams are independently arguing. We'll hopefully be able to talk more about what reframing specifically is later in, in, in this seminar, as well as in future seminars, but effectively what it is, is if, as the affirmative team, you've laid out what your arguments are and you have no arguments left and you've then just heard the negative team lay out what their arguments are, a good way of reframing the debate would say, OK, we've explained the benefits of our argument, argument X. On the comparative, the negative team gets argument Y and then maybe the way of reframing is saying, well, here is why argument X is something that you should care more about than argument Y. Here is why argument X affects far more people than argument Y does. So it is using the same sorts of arguments that might have been brought up at first speaker, but it is twisting them in a way that makes it unique and also directly comparative to that which your opposition talks about. That's something that's kind of complex and somewhat difficult to do in debating, but it is a useful tool to be able to use when you can. It also helps to extend second speeches when sometimes you won't have sufficient content for them. Finally, the third speaker has a role that is effectively just to be like a bit of a rebuttal machine and to finish the debate off. They should also do things like introduce and signpost what they do, but their primary role in the debate is to do rebuttal. At university level specifically though, that rebuttal, which we will talk about a lot later, shouldn't just take the form of some sort of like shopping list, being like, well, the first thing affirmative said was X, this is wrong because of Y reason. The second thing that they said was this, this is wrong for whatever reason. That is more than fine to do, but typically what third speakers will do is try to break down the debate into core issues or themes that they've seen. So if you're doing a debate that you know, revolves around certain economic policies that might affect 
you know, you might be taxing rich people significantly more. One of your points, one of your themes, because both teams probably would have invariably talked about it, is how does this affect the economy at large? The second one of your themes might be who better services working class people or poor people in the context of this debate? And those are things that capture arguments from both sides of the debate. Uh, another thing to note that links into this is that at high school level, it's something that is quite often done in debating uh, from third speakers is that they spend like two minutes towards the end just summing up what their team said. So they'll go, we bought you four points. You know, our first point was this, second point was this. That's a complete waste of time, really, because if the adjudicator is any good, they probably know what you said. Rather, it's good to weave these things into issues. So when you break the debate down by issues or by themes, and you categorise the material that both the opposition has said, which you're responding to, but also what you have said, then it becomes much easier to adjudicate, if you've ever seen adjudication being taken place, uh, the, the primary clashes that might occur in, 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 uh, in the debate. Um, I'll take the question in just a second. The final thing to note is the third speaker, sort of, I guess, by the rules of debating, can't have any new substantive content. Substantive is a term that effectively just means like the unique or individual points that you make, the sorts of things that your first speaker will say. Note, though, this is like a kind of common misconception in debating. Third speakers can still make new contributions to debates, can still make new responses to material that has come out, though note that those you know, new responses will probably be weighed a bit less significantly from an adjudicator since there hasn't been as much time for those to be you know, fairly contested by both sides. But if a third speaker wasn't allowed to have any new responses or any new contributions broadly, then there'd fundamentally just be no point of a third speaker existing in the first place. So, you know, don't feel like if you're a third speaker, you're sitting there and thinking, oh, shit, I can't use this rebuttal because my second speaker forgot to say it. You probably can, but just be aware it might not be weighted as heavily. You should rely on the material that your team has talked about, but you can, offer, you can, you can obviously make um, your own, you know, sorts of contributions to the debate. Do we have a question? Yeah. It doesn't really matter. If you come out and say, oh, I've seen three clashes in this debate, or there are three issues, or there are three themes, it doesn't matter. So long as you're clear with the adjudicator and they understand where you are, we'll go through signposting and structure stuff. Uh, but yeah, anything's uh, acceptable, really. Okay, so those are the jobs of the three speakers in the debate. Are uh, people broadly clear on that? Any clarifications or concerns? Cool. Uh, so now that we've talked about what the three speakers do individually, we'll talk about more what like a debate looks like from start to finish, say, and specific things that take place in them. The first thing to talk about then is models. If you don't know what a model is, a model, I think, as a simple definition, is the specific policy change that your side is advocating for, the mechanism or vehicle used to accomplish the motion that you set, change the status quo, and gain all the harms and benefits that you're actually trying to claim that it does. Model should be something that is introduced virtually immediately in a debate. A model that comes out at third will never win a debate. It won't even really be considered or factored into an adjudication. Models as well can vary in complexity. You'll get some topics like, the, you know, we should ban smoking or whatever, and the topic and, and the model will be quite straightforward. You'll say, well, the Australian government would ban, you know, tobacco or whatever. You might get topics that are way more amorphously worded and instead require you to define specific terms throughout the model such that it is clear exactly what policy change you're advocating for. We'll go through some examples in a second. When you're constructing a model, I think it's useful to ask the like W questions that you all get taught when you're younger. That is who, what, when, where, and the why effectively is the debate. Why you're actually implementing this policy is you know because you think it's good for X reason, because you think it would be bad for Y reason. That's the debate itself. So who is sometimes already defined for you. If you get a topic that the Australian government should ban smoking, then it's obviously the Australian government should ban smoking. But not who isn't just who is making the policy change. It can also be specifically who does that affect. If you have a topic, the Australian government should ban smoking, you might say that you're only banning certain people from smoking, though I don't know why you would do that. Uh, the what is probably the most complex one of the questions because it varies depending on exactly what the topic is. You know, what can encompass uh, in the case of you know having quotas for people in parliament, maybe specifically what those quotas are, the numerical figures attached to them, uh, also the extent to which you're carrying out the policy, it can be you know more significant. When I don't think matters a heap, there are some debates certainly where it might matter. For example, you could be doing a topic that Australia should pursue 100% renewable energy, and if you said, well, we're just doing this, 
you know, it, then obviously you run into a lot of problems in so far as you probably wipe out a heap of jobs. But if you say, well, we'd be, you know, slowly trending towards this and doing this by 2040, then that's something that's way more beneficial. If you get a debate that's we ban zoos, then saying we ban zoos, you know, tomorrow, it probably doesn't exactly matter the time frame in which you do that, though it sometimes does. Where is again similar to who, uh, you know, using the smoking example again, rather than restricting smoking for certain people, you might say, we're restricting or banning all smoking in public. That might be a bit of a dodgy way to get around the debate. But the illustration is that, you know, sometimes you might limit exactly where this debate takes place. We'll step through some examples in just a second. Uh, another thing with models is consider any like hazards or exceptions. I use this word hazards just, you know, sometimes you'll have a, mo uh, a model that the negative will have some like specific nitpick with that like undermines your case. Try to think of those things in advance. Often it's not particularly important, but for example, if you're doing a topic about banning zoos and you define zoos as, you know, animals being kept in captivity, then you might just be say, well, obviously this doesn't include animals that literally cannot live in the wild. Those are an exception. Uh, it's good if you can outline those early, but you can probably patch that up later in the debate. Uh, and finally, sometimes models are unnecessary, even though they're really foundational to a lot of debates that we're doing and probably will be necessary for the sorts of topics that we're doing later tonight. There are some topics where you just don't need a model. We'll step through some of those in a while. It should be relatively obvious whether a model is needed or not, depending on what the topic is specifically. So a few examples, I've gone through this one already, that we should ban smoking. Quite simple, you'd say, well, the government would outlaw the production, distribution, and consumption of tobacco-based products. That's effectively your model. You don't need to be overly grandiose with it, but you just should put that somewhere at the start of the speeches that are taking place. You might have a debate, and this is one where you get to, you know, define the who and the where more, that we should lower the voting age, and you'd say, well, Western liberal democracies should allow all people over the age of 16 to vote. In that model, note that you're not just saying, well, we should lower the voting age. You're specifically defining exactly what you're, limiting, what you're lowering the voting age to, but you're also explaining where this policy change would take place. Not everywhere, but in Western liberal democracies, you might want to do it in Australia. That is up to the discretion of the affirmative team Can in many circumstances. Um, yep. You can't just set it somewhere that's most advantageous to you, though. The only situation in which you would limit the places that it would be set would be because it wouldn't make sense to have it set anywhere else. Yep. So you can't just say, like, uh, we would ban like something that is like bad in one place and good in another, and then you set it in, in the first place. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so then, an example of a topic where the model might be more specific or, or, or requires a bit more complexity is if you get the topic of oh, we should abolish the ATAR. It probably requires you to explain what you're replacing the ATAR with specifically. In this circumstance, it'd say, oh, well, the government would strap the ATAR requirement and final exams, and universities would instead use a blend of interviews, whatever to decide instead, along with school marks and stuff. That is a circumstance where if you're like scrapping something in the first place and you've created some form of vacuum, you should probably in your model define what goes in place of that. Finally, a few topics where a model is just quite unnecessary. These are, the, the term that is used for these is like empirical motions in many circumstances, though I don't think we overly use that terminology anymore. But stuff like the music is the best form of art. There's obviously no policy that's being changed there. It's kind of you just having yarn about what your favorite song is or whatever. That we regret the underarm ball, or that we as Democrats would prefer a Bernie Sanders presidency to a Joe Biden presidency. In these sorts of topics, there's clearly no policy change. There's no you know, overt thing that you're changing. You're more just arguing about the state of the world and which one you think is better, which one you think is worse. In those sorts of topics, don't worry about a model. Uh, though no, you know, as a bit of a spoiler tonight, all the topics can entail a model. Uh, we're not gonna do anything too complex off the bat. Uh, similarly, the negative team is able to come up with counter models, which is effectively you know, their own policies to combat a certain thing. So. You know, even though a traditional debate is that the affirmative is advocating for some sort of policy change and the negative is defending the status quo, maybe the status quo just does really suck, and in which case it would be pretty bad for the negative to try to defend them. So instead, they'll try to implement their own sorts of policies. Note though that if the negative is implementing their own policies, models, mechanisms, whatever you want to call them, these should be things that are mutually exclusive meaning it shouldn't be something the affirmative team can do as well. Because the issue with that is if the negative team comes up and they have their counter model explaining these awesome policy changes they can make, but the affirmative can do them too, then the affirmative can just do it, say, well, we'd stand by our model, but we'll also just take all the benefits of the thing that you're doing and implement your model too, which strategically as the negative team puts you in a bit of a hole. 
Moreover, if you're having a counter model as the negative team, be quite wary of being really overly concessionary. We'll go through an example of what that means soon. But you might agree that something is bad and then just go 99% of the way to fulfilling exactly what the affirmative team's policy is, but have a few exceptions. That seems to imply that you agree in many ways with the affirmative team. Just remember that debating is fundamentally a contest, so there should be points of difference. Um, yeah, and as I said, these counter models also do things like change the status quo. So a few counter models. Uh, if we get a topic that's we should lower the voting age, your sorts of things that you might say is, well, we progressively lessen the weight of votes of people over the age of 60. You might want to do that because the debate is centered around young people not getting enough of a voice in parliament, not getting enough of a voice in elections broadly. Or you could just say, well, we'll advertise and really you know, give mechanisms to incentivize young people to vote. Do you reckon that's a good counter model? <coughs> Why not? Someone, say something, come on. Yeah. The yeah, so the affirmative can just say, oh, cool, good idea, we'll do that too. And then you've effectively just wasted your first negative speech if it's built on this foundation and it becomes quite hard for you to defend those things. Another example, if you get a topic that we should ban zoos, you say, well, we ban keeping domestic animals in captivity except for lemurs or whatever animal, <laughs> right? Why is that not a, a good model or a good counter model? Yeah. Yeah, it's just needlessly concessionary. It seems to imply, oh yeah, actually the affirmative's right, but you know, there's this wacky exception that might take place. Uh, it, it's just saying it's concessionary and therefore not particularly useful. Uh, if you get a topic that's, we should abolish the ATAR, you might say, well, we would keep the ATAR, but we'll lessen its weight proportionally and partner it with other sorts of systems. Do we think that's like a good counter model? <laughs> it's, I think, there could be issues with it, but that's a broadly a, that's broadly a pretty reasonable counter model for the reason that you're doing something that the affirmative team fundamentally can't do. You're still admitting the ATAR system is good, and although you know you could argue that this model is a bit concessionary, and that could certainly be an argument that the affirmative team runs, if you're still fundamentally upholding the thing that you clearly kind of should be in a debate, then that's probably sufficient and requisite. Note as well, though, on mutual exclusivity and being overly concessionary, it is not impossible as a negative team to win debates just because you're doing something that is not mutually exclusive or because it's concessionary. You might argue that your policy of you know, progressively lessening the weight of votes of old people is only really possible or would only be politically palatable if you don't also give votes to 16-year-olds, but you need to do a lot of groundwork to establish that. Moreover, um, you know, the Lemus example is a bit shocking, but you can, as is illustrated by the second example, concede some things, suggest that well, maybe the ATAR isn't perfect, but there are some other issues. It just requires you to establish the legwork to explain why you're conceding the certain ground that you are and why your model takes place in the way that it is. Uh, do models make sense to people or anything to add? Sick. Uh, I don't know what's next. Okay, next, onto case construction. So case construction is effectively that which you're doing when you're coming up with your material, creating your points. Uh, this is specifically more talking about the individual points that you do actually create. Uh, there's this, I, I guess you could call it an acronym, but there's no way anyone's remembering SQMI. Uh, it's very meaningless, isn't it? But, you know, if you follow this kind of three-step process, you'll probably be most of the way to getting a pretty useful point. We'll illustrate what these things mean eventually, or in a second. We'll say, firstly, you know, what is the status quo? Secondly, what mechanism do we have to change the status quo? Thirdly, what are the impacts of that mechanism? What's the impact of that mechanism? What changes are we making specifically? So, firstly, onto the status quo, uh, you should fundamentally just explain what the world looks like now. And if you're the affirmative team advocating for a policy change, Obviously, you should argue that the world now is not very good in the areas that you want to change it. So, you might explain why those things are bad, or why those things are good, sorry, or, yeah, bad. Or, if you're the negative team and you're defending the status quo, you might say, well, the status quo is quite good at the moment. A good way to illustrate these points is, you know, if you're talking about certain things, something might not be terrible at the moment, but you might, might not the trajectory that something is going in, and explain that, you know, even though it's not quite the status quo yet, that what will be the status quo in 10 years' time, say, you might want the urgency of something. Uh, so you should kind of create an imperative for the change that you want to occur in the first place. If you don't explain why the world is bad, it's probably hard to convince people that we need to change the world. Uh, you know, rather, if you say, well, everything's a bit shit, uh, you know, then people are probably more likely to, to be receptive to any forms of change that you want to make. 
Second thing in case construction then is mechanisms, and that is what specific changes you would make to the status quo. That can take the form of your model or in debates where a model isn't taking place of you know, other things. Uh, effectively, you should explain why and in what ways the type of, you know, you change the behaviour of individuals as a direct result of your proposals. You might explain that certain groups react to your policy changes in different ways. You know, you might know the specific things that you're actually changing in people. The other thing to note about mechanisms is you should try to causally explain how the motion changes the state of the world or how your mechanism or model changes the state of the world specifically. I think this is a great, you know, fatal flaw in many teams' case in that they'll have a policy and then just claim that it's really great and that it's changed the world, but they haven't like causally explained the link between those those two things. Instead, they'll just say, well, we're implementing this sort of policy that could be good for women. Here's why being good for women is the best. That's excellent. Uh, whereas that just requires like a bit of a leap in the logic, say, you should probably step through sequentially all the things that take place. Uh, an example of this is, uh, I don't know if people know what like, the Bechdel test is, but that's that thing in movies where if you have like two women characters, you only pass the Bechdel test if they have a conversation isolated on screen where they talk about something other than a man. You might get a topic that is, uh, you know, all movies should be required to pass the Bechdel test. And, you know, uh, not causally explaining your mechanism would say, the, you know, movies that fail the Bechdel test are inherently a bit sexist. Sexism is bad. We solve sexism and that's why we win. That's kind of a bit bizarre and unintuitive to a lot of people and can be attacked. If you rather explain, though, that, you know, movies that fail the Bechdel test are inherently a bit sexist for, you know, the reasons that you might list in the status quo, say, so widely disseminated is popular culture and movies and stuff that it, you know, dissipates into the collective ethos, you know, your next step might be to say, many people, especially those who are sexist, often don't have a lot of conversations with women and make up their own conclusions about what women talk about and stuff. At the point where a lot of those people are the specific actors that engage most with things like popular culture and movies, we probably marginally change those minds. And then you get to the next level and the next level after that, sequentially explaining causally how you get from your first step from your model specifically through uh, 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 to the change that you actively want to see. Um, I think a good way to think about this when you're writing your points is if you've just made a conclusion, or if you've just finished a point or, or a sentence, you know, claiming some sort of benefit, you say, oh, well, we've solved racism, we did it, boys. You might say, why is it true that we have done this? And if everything doesn't add up in what you've said or what you're going to say, then you probably need to do more work with your mechanism to explain how you accomplish the benefit that you get. The final part of case construction is impact. I'll put some exclamation marks there because it's pretty important probably the most important thing in a debate, and that is why the change that your mechanism accomplishes is actually something that is good or bad, or in short, why we should actually care about the change that you're accomplishing. When you're doing this, I think it's really important or really beneficial, I suppose, to consider the comparative. So you might have, have a policy that gets more women into parliament, and then you, you know, a, a, a poorer team would just say, we've got more women into parliament, how good's that, sweet. But instead, if you say the alternative or the, the, uh, the comparative is that there are far less women in parliament and that leads to X, Y, and Z negative ramifications that we would rather avoid, because of our policy uniquely, we set ourselves on a different trajectory by which policy making, etc., would be far better. Uh, so you note you know, the status quo here and, and tie it to things like that. Uh, also, comparatives don't have to just be against the status quo. If the opposition have run a counter model, you say, okay, well, the world that we get fundamentally looks like this. That is far preferable to the opposition's world under their counter model, which is likely to look like this thing that you should argue, at least, is far worse. Similarly, when you're running through impacts, it's important that you quantify your benefits and harms. There's a few ways you can do that. You can just note the scale of the change that you've actually accomplished. Uh, you know, if you've made some massive change, it's probably good to note that you've made some sort of massive change, but make sure you mechanistically prove that you get that change. You might consider the probability of that change taking place. So maybe you're trying to claim a benefit that's monumental, such as, you know, destroying racism or whatever. And, you know, that's a hard goal to make. But if you're like 50% chance to do that, you wouldn't say, oh, this is only going to happen half and half, you know, like on a half, half point of view but you would explain that you're more likely to get to that goal than the status quo would be at or than the opposition's uh, counter model would be at. 
Another way to quantify your benefits and harm is to explain why your stakeholders are the most important. We'll talk about what those, what those mean uh, in a second. But, you know, uh, in, in debates, you know, you might have a debate about taxing the rich far more. And the affirmative might say, well, the most important stakeholder in this debate is poor people who are, you know, on government handouts. Uh, and the negative team might probably bizarrely run that, you know, Michael Bloomberg's the most important person in the debate. And if they do that well, they could hypothetically win. So it's important to explain why the unique stakeholder that you're trying to benefit is the most important. That might be for some sort of principled reason. That might be because they're owed something. That might be because the actor that you're, you know, acting as owes something to those people in particular. Finally, in, in, in impacts, it's important to weigh your impacts against those, your opposition. I kind of talk about this when I'm talking about comparative stuff, but also when I talked about reframing a bit earlier in the debate, maybe your main benefit in the debate is some great economic transformation that you get that's good for the middle class. Maybe their main benefit is something that could, you know, uniquely benefit a certain group of people who are minority. Uh, that is a hard thing to resolve if you're adjudicating. But if you do some legwork explaining why this group or this group is far more important than the other, why the government or, or an adjudicator should care far more about that group, then that goes a long way to actively impacting the arms that you get. If this doesn't make sense, we're about to run through an example using a topic that will show you, you know, the status quo, the mechanisms and the impacts in just a second. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's alright. So, um, if we're here, if we're the affirmative team on a topic that is the government should tax companies' use of technology that is replacing human labour, which was a topic that was set at Easter's not particularly long ago, um, one of your key points as an affirmative team might be, well, this protects workers. The status quo then would be, well, low-skilled workers are being replaced by automation. Workers can't compete with robots, dr robots due to a series of factors such as people you know, requiring wage wages, wanting rights, being less efficient. You might say, well, those workers then have nowhere else to go because they are often not skilled and retraining those workers is costly and it's often quite ineffective. Your mechanism then is the model that you've implemented that you might define earlier. Uh, that, you know, I'm not going to go through here specifically, but you'll say, well, that model that we do provides a financial incentive for companies to use workers because those companies are profit-oriented. It punishes those companies that have replaced workers in the first place. And also, just because you're implementing a tax, it gives the government far more resources to allocate to retraining programs such that they become more effective. What is then the impact of those changes that you've made? You'd say, well, people's livelihoods are more important than the economic efficiency you might get. That is clearly being comparative in a debate, and you might have to prove that a bit more than it just says in that slide there, but if you're able to explain why we should care more about people than about economic efficiency, that goes a long way to impacting your points. Uh, you say, well, this protects jobs of the most vulnerable people who are being widely displaced by you know, mechanical work, by robot arms and stuff like that. And you might also note things like the trajectory so you'd say, well, long term, we make the transition between, uh, between occupations better at the point where we're able to better retrain workers since we now have more capital to allocate to retraining workers. Does that kind of make sense? You've got a problem. Here's how you're fixing it. Here's why fixing it's really excellent. That's kind of how you step through a point beginning to end. Further things on case construction is how to come up with extra points. In many circumstances, you'll be able to come up with like two points, say, but you'll struggle to think of other things. Ways that you can do this, and note we'll be having a seminar in week six presented by Seamus, who's excellent at debating about case construction. But in brief, you might consider principled arguments, which I outlined earlier. Principled arguments are sort of complex, but to their core, you might say, well, is this consistent with something that society already widely accepts or widely does? And is this just an extension of that principle? So if you're doing a debate about uh, drug testing welfare recipients, say, uh, you might note that under the status quo, we already require a lot of welfare recipients to prove that they're seeking employment in the first place. You might explain that principally the money that welfare recipients receive is from the taxpayer, and thus taxpayers have a, you know, a, a justified reason to define the terms through which that, that money is paid to them. Secondly, with principles, you could say, well, is there a compelling moral obligation that this motion specifically fulfills? For example, if you get a topic about granting you know, more land to Indigenous Australians, you might say this is morally and principally a justified thing to do if the government is, is, is giving this land because the government fundamentally wronged those people in the first place and you know, this fulfills a moral duty that they have. 
Secondly, in further case construction, you can consider various stakeholders that the policy would impact. Stakeholders are just groups of people, places, and you might think disproportionately whether your policy is probably likely to impact those people, and then you can run a point uniquely on those people and why it's important for them. Final broad thing I think I want to talk about is rebuttal, which is just your responses to the opposition which highlight the inaccuracy, inadequacy or inefficiency of their argumentation. A few things to note about rebuttal is that you should firstly engage with the opposition's most important content. A few nitpicks about something the second speaker said <coughs> as like a bit of a slip is unlikely to win you a debate. You should also be charitable, so consider the best version of the opposition's argument because the adjudicator is probably <coughs> sorry, I'm losing my voice, is probably likely to consider that as well. Thirdly, you should be comparative and explain why your content's better. I've talked a lot about comparativeness. And fourthly, you should get, engage in even ifs. So not just say, well, I've disproved this and therefore the entire argument falls. You should rather say, I've disproved this, but even if you believe this, you know, here's why it still doesn't matter. A few examples of that. You know, if your rebuttal uh, using the example of protecting workers is, well, the affirmative thing, the robot apocalypse is coming or some shit just because of a few Coles kiosks, Here's why robots won't take over. Why is that rebuttal not great? Not charitable. Yeah, it's not charitable rebuttal. It doesn't paint them in a good light, and it doesn't paint you in a good light either. Another form, oh, that's, it's better to say, well, the replacement of workers is not as widespread as claimed, and will only impact certain fields and go into more detail if you want rebuttal. You might also say, well, since I've proved that the well-being of the economy is the most important, their point about protecting workers doesn't matter. What's wrong with that rebuttal? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, somewhat, and it also doesn't engage in like an even if, because, you know, if you just don't engage with that argument about protecting workers because you think the economy is more important, that is probably going to be a great failing of your team. It is rather better to say, well, the economy should take precedence in this debate, but even if you think protecting workers is the most important thing, their model doesn't properly protect workers, uh, you know, for X, Y, Z reason. That gives you like a second layer of protection effectively against the argumentation that they are making because it is not always true that you're just on the right side of the debate. Often an adjudicator will think the other team has had more compelling material and if you're able to engage with them as many levels as possible, then that's really good. You know, next, some types of rebuttal really quickly. Standard rebuttal is just the sort of checklist style stuff I was talking about earlier. They said this, we say this. Integrated rebuttal is something that you can do, especially I think it's useful at first negative and second affirmative speaker, where you're trying to lay out a bit of a case, where you weave your rebuttal specifically into the points that you're making. So instead of getting up and spending two minutes rebutting to the opposition on the basis of economics, when later in your speech you have a four minute segment about economics, you might get to that four minute segment not doing the rebuttal in the first place and say, this is directly responsive to the opposition's material about economics. Thirdly, you have thematic and issues-based rebuttal. I talked briefly about this uh, earlier, but that is often broad stuff. You weave in your own content and you do that at third speaker. Uh, other things, introduction structure and signposting. Uh, introductions should just be like interesting. If you get up and start your speech by being like, hello, my name's Sweeney, uh, the topic's this, then like, the, the GK's fucking bored shitless, aren't they, right? <laughs> they'll, they'll turn off immediately, and it happens a lot of the time. Uh, try to have like an inspiring sort of first 30 seconds, like it's a call to action, try to make it amusing. Uh, the second thing is structure and signposting, which is really important, especially early in speeches, but also it's useful to have in rebuttal. Structure is just at the start of your speech, being like, today I'm gonna to do five things. The first is introduce a model, then I'll introduce four points of substantive material and explain what those things are sequentially. Signposting is throughout your speech, flagging those things that you talked about in, in your introduction. Because often in debates you have a lot of numbers, you have three points, and under those points you have three sub-points, and then under that you have, you know, two reasons that this thing's true, and then you're engaging with it even if somewhere. Eventually the adjudicator probably will get lost because they don't have your notes in front of them, they're trying to take their own ones. So you might say through your speech, I'm now moving on to my first broad point, this is this, there's three reasons this is true, and then after that is done you'll say, now onto the second major piece of material why this is economically so good. Uh, yeah, so that is the outline and structure, the first sort of thing that you're doing, and then signposting is the latter thing that you're doing. Preparation time is really important in the context of debates. As I said, you've got 30 minutes. 
There I've drawn up what I think is like a, a sort of ideal table of how you and how each individual speaker spends their preparation time uniquely. Note that preparation time begins immediately as the topic is given out to you, and that includes then the time you spend walking to the room that you get to. So in many circumstances you don't have the full 20, you know, 30 minutes, it's more like 25 or something like that. What you should do at the start, virtually, oh, also important to note that, you know, it's conventional that the affirmative team prepares in the room that you're actually debating, the negative team just prepares somewhere outside. That's just how it works, because like, there's not that much space. Yeah, sorry. All right, so what you should do, zero to five minutes, topic selection and walk into the room. We'll explain what topic selection is in just a second. Five to 10 minutes, and maybe this might take 10 minutes itself, could take longer, is silent brainstorming. Uh, I've put exclamation marks this because everyone I know engages in silent brainstorming. If you don't, the issue is you get like whoever's the most talkative to come in and go, well this debate is about economics. And then everyone's mind is just railroaded about economics specifically. You get into group think and you're unable to come up with a you know, unique array of points that covers more material. If you spend at least five minutes in silent trying to prepare what you have, you're more likely to have a wider breadth of content which will benefit your team. Then, the next five minutes you should spend on discussion and allocation of those points. Everyone proposes those points that they have come up with, and then you allocate them you know, from best to worst through your first speaker, through to your second speaker. You might discard points, you might think points would be better save as things for rebuttal. You have a brief chat about that. Subsequently to that, first and second speaker, you should probably write their speech, probably more important for first speakers to do specifically. And a third speaker might think of you know, rebuttals to the opposition, things they might anticipate the opposition to say, or just help their team in whatever way they can, maybe write a model. A, Last good five to, a good way to think about it is the first speaker's speech is written by the whole team collaboratively, not just the first speaker. So everybody should know everything that's going into it, all the reasons and examples. Yeah, so it's really important, you know, your writing speeches, the second might only have one point that they're writing, and it might be contingent on what the negative team say. So your writing speeches, and you know, the first speech is the most important one. A model is something as well the entire team should know. It's not just something you say, hey, you know, Mr. First, make the model, cheers. Uh, yeah, so help your team, but sometimes, you know, you'll, you'll have time. Uh, to, to, to allocate to everything. Some tips, just be respectful and attentive during preparation. Sometimes people like struggle to explain specifically what they mean, but they've probably had an idea for a reason, not just because they're crazy. So hear them out and make sure you like pay them the respect that they deserve, especially if you don't know them. Moreover, you know, the timing that I put up in this chart might differ by team by what the topic is. If it's really complex, you might need more time to brainstorm, more time to chat as a team. Uh, and finally, I think mean, as a general tip, if Three of you are in a team and three of you have come up with a point. That point is probably quite a strong point. That's probably an indication that that point should be something that is quite, you know, massive in your team's case. So it might be the first speaker's first point. Okay, topic selection. Uh, that is something that is uh, definitely, I'd say, new to like just about everyone. In topic selection, effectively three topics get presented uh, and each team gets to independently rank topics based on their preferences. Therefore, each team gets to veto a topic. The one that they preference third is automatically rubbed out. Don't worry, we'll go through an example of this in just a second. Effectively, you are, designed, you are reaching a consensus on the topic with your opposition, and then of the three topics that are presented, you debate one of them, the most mutually acceptable one. That's done immediately after topics are revealed and often takes you know, two to three minutes of your preparation time. You might have a brief chat with, about, with your team. In fact, you should about which topic you'd most like to do. Uh, that often requires face-to-face -face contact with, with other teams, so you need to find them before you get your, your uh, before you go to debate. Like, know who you're debating against and go and find them. Got some tournaments, we're like doing that online now. Uh, it shouldn't take long. And you also can't change your preferences once you've announced them to another team. As an example, using these three topics is a very obvious illustration. If you've got these, this house would ban oxygen, this house would ban zoos, this house believes the earth is round. If you're the affirmative, which one do you reckon is the worst topic to debate there? <laughs> If you're affirming the last, the last one's fine as an affirmative, I think. So it's the first one, right? And then immediately, regardless uh, of what the negative team does, that topic has been vetoed by the affirmative team. That will not be a topic that is, is done. So if every team, or if you hate a topic so much, you can get rid of it. Uh, you rank the, the rest of the topics as you so please. The negative would do the same. They would probably veto the final topic. And then you reach what is the mutually acceptable topic. That is the one that you're debating. We'll, we've got two more examples and I'll take the question. Other circumstances, that's the most straightforward circumstance, where one team vetoes one, other team vetoes another one, then you've got one left over. There are more complex circumstances. So here, we believe tertiary education should be free, we decriminalise recreational drugs, we believe Kyrgyzstan should implement a, a narrow banking regulation. Probably both teams are vetoing this final motion, right? You know, meaning that you've got a mutual veto, and then you run into the conundrum where you've got kind of just an open topic, oh, you've got two topics that could potentially be debated. 
That is then resolved by how you've ranked them. If you've both ranked them the same, then you do the, the one that you've both you know, ranked as number one. That's again, pretty obvious circumstance. The only time you run into any massive issue is when there's sort of like a cross conflict, say, or a cross preferencing of things. So here, if the affirmative team, you know, like highest ranks the first topic, and then the negative team highest ranks the second topic, you've got two potential topics that you can do. And the only way you can resolve this this, this took me like two hours. Is <laughs> uh, you flip a coin or you do sister paper rock or something like that. You effectively just break that deadlock. Here, because it's heads, the convention is you would do the higher topic, but make sure you actually speak with the team before you flip a coin. Don't just flip a coin and be like, oh, it's heads, it's the top one. Just be like, hey, if it's heads, we're doing the top one. Yep, and make sure you know that's clear because sometimes you run into problems. Uh, and then you've got that topic. About topic selection, really importantly, no matter how the preferences and vetoes go, just audibly say to the other team, like, confirm with them, with them which one you're doing. You might talk and it might become a bit lost in translation. If you just do the cross vetoes, you know, it could be confusing. So just always be like, oh, so we're doing the top one, yes? And they'll be like, yep. Yeah. And then they'll be like, ah, oh, sick, you know. <laughs> Make sure you, you're, you're on the, the same page. So you need paper. Also write it down on paper. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can't, you can't just like sit there and hear that, you know, the other team doesn't want to, you know, write something or do one topic in particular and then be like, oh, you know, should do this independently, you should write it down on paper, uh, just be honest. Right. Uh, types of topics, uh, I don't know if we really have time for. It isn't particularly important right now. These things will be introduced to, you know, going forward. Uh, so don't worry about this. All the topics that we're debating tonight will be the sorts of ones that you can implement a policy in, have a model with. Other ones will be introduced with later in the debate. Uh, late, later in the semester. Final thing is just a few general tips and words of advice. Firstly, in debates, I think there's like a, a big fascination with making sure you claim the biggest ever possible benefit and that, you know, therefore you win the debate. That isn't always true. Sometimes small but really concrete impacts or concrete points can be far more compelling. For example, if you're doing a topic that is like about sports to its core, like it's really just about sports, nothing more interesting, running a point about how like, you, I don't know, like stop Trump or something, probably like is, is really speculative and is unlikely to be that incredible. Uh, but if you just run something that's like, you know, here's why fucking rugby's more entertaining now, then that is a small impact, but it's one that is relevant to the debate and is good. Uh, secondly, in debating, don't worry about being particularly formal or whatever. It is not like a perfect science debating. Find the style that works for you. That might take a, a while if you haven't done a lot of debating before. You might pick up things from each individual speaker that you see speak, and you'll event effectively, you'll eventually find something uh, that you like. Uh, you, when I first started doing debating, I was like, shit at the public speak. I fucking hate like ordering Subway, right? Like, you know, I hate doing stuff like this. But if you just get up and like kind of have a yarn, and like, you know, here's why I mean, tax are rich or whatever, then, you know, I think that's a good way to, to, to think about it early. Um, the last tip is, is not one that we have to worry about overly about the respective capital. That's something we'll go in more when we talk about um, case construction in week six. And finally, just like have fun. Uh, that's it.